getting money. Recreation, uh, land, and they really do go together uh, because they do impact one another one way or another. So uh, with that, uh, I would, uh, we, we do have our director here, Ms. Don. Don, are you here yet? Don Woodward? Yeah, we'll go get her out here. But uh, I'd like her to uh, come on up and uh, maybe say a few words. Uh, you know, this is uh, a big event here uh, that's been going on for uh, several years now. So come on up, Don. Uh, this is Don. She's the director of Hydro, who oversees uh, all of the operating and maintenance of the dams here. So I wanted to introduce her today uh, so that you would know. So this is John Woodward, and maybe we can hear a few words from her. Don, I'm going to encourage you. Wait, I'm going to be on the spot, right? Hey, everybody. Day. I think we did do an outstanding job planning and getting invitations out, setting up the presentations and demonstrations that help you understand the importance of what we're doing here and protecting, preserving, and perpetuating the water. Of course, I will now run for you. So, really appreciate you all here today. I really appreciate the lot of them. And this, uh, these are important things that we're discussing. I appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Concerns and issue over uh, the uh, remains that came out of the embankment, and since then there's been some work and uh, whatnot, you know, uh, that's been done on uh, the Kennewick Man, both by the government and by the independent uh, um, uh, people uh, that got uh, honestly uh, put together to also do a study. And they, they went to court, and uh, um, they, uh, it was provided that they would have that to uh, do the study. So um, at this time, uh, we'd like to uh, present and uh, welcome uh, Dr. Doug Osley from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. So Doug. A little bit uh, one of one grant community requests to be here. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Doug. So we'll turn it over to Doug. Uh... Okay, I told you this is how it's going to fall. Is it working? Am I on? Yeah. Uh, you can hear me okay? <laughs> Who those remains represent. 
trained as an analyst. I'm a human analyst in terms of my background, and I'm also a model trained as an archaeologist. I have not as experience as the archaeologists that you deal with in this area I'm from the university, the Washington University, but I have decades of experience, and I'm especially experienced in terms of how I'm going to deal with how to find questions, apply best and grades, very remains, how to excavate so that those remains can then be identified, presented in a court of law, as what happens. I testified as an expert witness, and when I was originally brought into this case, at least from the timeline, it was through a call in the coroner's office to assist in examining remains with something that they did not quite fully understand, not something that they were used to. Things got out of hand, things got out of hand. When in a direction that I would prefer not to tell. But I do feel that in this instance, these remains don't look on out looking for those remains without skeletons. When it came out of the bag, I think that we should take the opportunity to learn from that skeleton. Human skeleton, in terms of the archaeological record, can tell you more about a path people, a path of life, a path of the adult, than anything else that you can talk about or think about in the archaeological record. <coughs> We brought in a group of scientists. That skeleton has not been accessible to scientists. We brought in, in our case, a group of two levels of scientists. Very experienced, having done it for decades, basically geezers, but having decades of experience in terms of the analysis. And then we also wanted to bring in younger generation scientists that represent the future that really have special expertise and can contribute to this. From that, from that analysis, we examined the remains over a period of about a week in 2005, and then another week and a half, 2006. Different scientists had very specific choreographed time intervals that they could collect the kinds of information that they're specialists in. There are two reports that will come from our investigation. And it is true yesterday we talked about that there are still questions. And I will identify some of those questions, some things that we still could learn from further examination. But I want to take you down the road as to how we examine these remains, the process of this investigation, and what we learned from it. As I say, there are two different reports. In this particular study, because I consider this skeleton absolutely the most important set of remains. I've examined Confederate soldiers on the Humley submarine plane. I've examined more Civil War soldiers than anybody can think of. I've done uh, examinations of J-Cap columns. I find those things fascinating. But this skeleton has been not one that I wanted, wanted to build my career on, but one that I am so interested in the history of this country, and I feel that we know so little about it. Like 9,000, 10,000 years ago, that I felt that this man can tell us a lot about that time. You can count on your fingers the number of well preserved, well dated skeletons that date to this time period, and this is, as you will see, an exceptionally well preserved skeleton that could tell us a great deal. Within this, as I say, there are two reports. This is the first one. I call for a special commitment on the scientists that are represented in this to reach two audiences. For one thing, to explain very carefully and in great, great details to the scientists what the studies, what the evidence is, so that they can, for one thing, draw their own conclusions, they can interpret the out, they can have a high school value, they can see that. So that particular report is nearing, is complete, it will be exceedingly detailed, it will be over 30 chapters, most chapters range in length, but the Tapana chapter for instance, is seven pages long in terms of double space. And it will be exceedingly detailed for these chapters. And it will talk about the farming, which I will explain. It will talk about the health of the man. It will talk about the relationships of the man. It will talk about dietary reconstruction, all of it. Within this, however, I also want to reach another audience. I want to reach high school level students, interested adults, junior high. I want to like for that level so that people that don't want every little fact but yet, we want to understand some of the things that you were learning. We put together this one. This one has just come out from Learner Press. And this particular book is for your library over here at the Heritage 
Second, when we embark on one trip, that team to be put in the library at one time. I learned a great deal from this investigation. Each investigation that I get involved in, I learn more and more. I had the privilege of working with a number of different scientists that are truly specialists in their field, and they brought me along. I'm going to try and represent them in terms of it what they are telling me in their reports for the second line, which is going to be published by Texas A&M University Press. It realistically is about a year or two months away before it reaches. But it is coming. I learned about techniques that I didn't know existed. I use in my forensic work now a great deal of computer tomography. I make identification all the time on computer tomography. Use plain film, digital radiography all the time. CT, but it is in this case that I first learned about industrial CT. Computer tomography, you're used to that in your computer hospital experiences. And when you're talking about industrial CT, you're talking the same thing, but it, it operates at a much higher level of precision. And when you're introducing, for instance, CT, one of the things that you're interested in is not only the external structure, but the internal structure, and I want to see within. In this case, as you'll see, there's a lot of things I want to see within inside these bones. But one of the things was to extract the projectile point in the digital world and be able to reproduce it so that we could really see it whole, no replica of it, and be able to then identify the different types of projectile point. This is the first version reproductive, stereolithographic model of the projectile point that is embedded in this gap. We will see it in more detail if we want. Industrial CT be not quite like what you're used to seeing in a hospital. But one of the things that it does, when you're going into a hospital for a, a CAT scan, uh, they're very concerned about the dosage of the radiation. When you're dealing with something that is bone, you are not concerned with that, so you can take it at a higher dose and be extremely precise. And so the source itself, this is going to be the, the tube, this is going to be the screen, and the cranium is in multiple pieces. The cranium needed to be reconstructed in the way that we wanted to go about it because there's a whole field called the body that I will talk about. But we need to reconstruct the cranium so that we can take precise measurements on it to get into different types of comparisons that relate to who is this individual related to. And so when I look at this, for example, here, for instance, this is the cranial ball. You're seeing the bridge of the nose, the bottom of the nasal bone is there. This is going to be the cranial magnet where the spinal cord goes in. And these are other cranial fibers. We'll position them so that the x ray is going to essentially penetrate all of these different bones. And with those different bones, this, for example, being a cheap bone right here, and you see it in virtual reality here, this is looking at the virtual model on a computer screen that is produced by SCT. So it's a 3D model, it's a three-dimensional model. And within this, one of the things that we want to look at, for example, is to really understand the size and distribution of these radiating tractors in the side in, in the side of the head. Because it's a question, is that or not traumatic injury? What is the process behind that? And one of the things that we're going to say is that as we look at this, this is going to be post one fracture. Not something that was there on Here's a different version of it, different model of the end, we've seen different portions of the cranium, different fragments of it. And each one of these then can be put into a virtual, virtual model and then we can feed it into a computer-driven 3D copy, three-dimensional copy that will use a photosensitive polymer laid out an extremely fine layer, layer down another layer, another layer, until it actually builds that replica up. Once we have these individual pieces, we can take these pieces and we can reassemble them. And it would have been much simpler, much simpler to just take the crane and everything refits so nicely that you can put it back together. But in this instance, we have alternative motives behind this and we would produce it uh, in, in this 3D, really sensitive 3D reconstruction, put that together. And then one of the first steps for the people that are on this crane, okay, for instance, is to gauge how accurate this is. And I can tell you that it's an extremely active model. You can take measurements on it that will duplicate those that are on the active bone themselves. However, I will also tell you that it is not a replacement to the original bone. It is not perfect. It is extremely difficult to 
<coughs> why that together when you're dealing with these plastic bottles in terms of how they fit together. I can also tell you that it is extremely expensive to use this type of thing. I have in my office, right across the hall, I use it all the time when I work. I have a, 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 a Siemens Somatol Research CT scanner. The one that we're using here is 10 years earlier and extremely advanced. But to gain access to that experimental machine at the time we did, just the CT scan alone, funded, funded by our donor, $25,000 just to scan that set of books. So we put it together, and one of the things that you need to do when you're working with these photosensitive plastics, these photosensitive plastics, is you cannot leave them exposed to light. And you cannot leave them for any length of time without them continuing to cure and shrink. So what you need to do is you need to take these and make an exact replica, in other words, a traditional cast, and something that's going to be basically plastic or Paris, and you're going to have you know, fibers and things like that that's very durable. So this is a Smithsonian, uh, basically a person that works on dinosaur bones, casting dinosaur bones, and then you can cast this so that we can have a replica that will hold up. The original will be a trick. So he's making, he's making a cast here, and then once we have the cast, we will work on photographs. And by the time we have uh, the opportunity to examine the bones, we will go ahead and then try and paint them to as close a color as we can to the actor. Now, in relation to this, I want to point out a couple of different things. For one thing, features that you can see that identify this as a male, clearly a male, and it would include his brow color, it would include his square chin, the slope of his forehead, females tend to have more of a vertical forehead, females tend to have less brow as well. Within that, one of the things that I will talk about is you'll see that we have, you'll see that we still have some gray paint on here. That's because there is an hearing, and if you're from this area, you're not so unfamiliar with it, but you have calcium carbon adhering to these bones. And I'll talk more about that because it's a very important indicator. And in that calcium carbon, where your dentist on the skull is going to be back behind you, ear opening the ear opening right here on the vascular process, like 100 ear on the base of the skull. You see that I have gray pigments, the gray stains from the calcium carbon. In the back area, this we refer to as the nuchal area. There is relatively little on the forehead area, the side of the head. The team that we would use would involve specialists, and in the way that we go about our work is very careful documentation. We have extremely high regard for these remains. We know that they represent the individual, and we're looking at them with an understanding of that, and we're also looking at them with the eyes of what can you tell me about who you work. And from that, so we're looking at them in the eyes of the scientists, and we need to document everything I do, whether it's a missing person, forensic case, I write reports. I write reports. If I have any young people in here that are interested in my field, the one thing I need to say is get all English writing skills we can. I slot for every word, and what I write in this case, I can identify the player. You have to be able to write, not just do this kind of stuff, but to write. And so in this process, the people you see here, this is the conservator that we brought in from Texas State and University. This is, in my opinion, the best at the geoarchaeologist. He has soil, bank profiles, and he is the best I know in terms of radio carbon dating. He is a specialist in isotopes and things like that. This is one of my assistants right here. Everything we're doing, we're documenting, we're describing the her, and she's recording. This is me right here. This is Dr. Kuberman, Kuberman from Tennessee. He is, in my opinion, and we went to graduate school together. He is as experienced as forensic anthropologist, and especially in the interpretation of trauma, interpretation of traumatic injuries. He can read bone fractures. He can tell, for instance, if you hit by a car, he can tell you how you were standing, where you were. You know, what your rationality was, where the car you to, and he can read those rapidly. And then that's what he does as an expert witness all the time. So he is here to help us interpret the breakings that we will see in these bones. One of the things that we do is we will document very carefully all of the colors. 
and the color of the bones, the color for exceedingly important. And one of the reasons it's important is because initially, and some of the government studies, if you go back to your reports, they talk about the possibility of they making red over, red over on the bone. And that is the basic question too is, is, is this an intentional burial or is it not a burial? And there is evidence that you can come from both directions that were put forward and assert that it could be an intentional burial or it could be someone that died inadvertently in a flood and was carried down the river and eventually came to rest and was covered up by silt. And there was, if you go back to all the report back then, they discussed that and debate the evidence. The evidence that they were relying on comes from a couple of different things. For one thing, they were relying on the possibility, or the probability, that they thought they saw red over. And if it's red over on the bones, that would be evidence of intentional covering of the body and that has silted out or settled down on the bones, and it's an intentional pigmentation. The other evidence that they're going to turn to is they say, look how complete these remains are, and because they are so complete, that also would argue that there's not been any evidence of exposure on the top. Any exposure from animal scattering, anything like that, which I see all the time in my forensic work if you do have remains that are surface, surface recoveries. If you're going to talk about <laughs> any kind of color, it's going to pick up soil, staining, it's going to pick up the iron from the soil, manganese from the soil, magnesium from the soil. It's going to pick up those things. And in order to bring the science world in, to deal with it. If you're painting your house, you, know, you go down to like, Clover or whoever and get your all your little paint chips and you try it out. That's you have to have a very organized way so that one scientist can say, well, this is light yellow, what does that mean? And they turn to bunch of colors and you can document them. And one of the things you see right here is we're looking at for a thymol fracture, a femur fracture, and we're looking at the fracture and the fact that that bone has been broken in half. And we would want to always expose fracture surfaces because we can sort out whether a fracture occurred recently, meaning at the time that the bones came out of the bank, or is it an old one, one that could occur hundreds of thousands of years ago? And in this instance, there are both no in terms of post-mortem processes, things that talk happen after death. There are fractures in the skeleton that are post-mortem and old post-mortem, thousands of years ago. You primarily see those. In terms of dry fractures, as the bones dried out over time, you primarily see those in fractures in the ribs and fractures in the vertebrae, just from the weight of the soil terrace pushing down on the bones. And in relation to that, when you look at the fracture edges, what helps to distinguish them is the fact that they will, instead of having light fracture margins, they will be dark to pick up the soil pigment at that time to pick up the soil pigment. I do this all the time in my forensic work. It, it has to do with postmortem processes. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking about this forensic case, was this person who's fat out here, was this person who has a broken bone and they that was an injury and responsible for contributing to the death of the person, or is it because the bones are out in the field and accounting on them, stuff, the steps on the bone recently and broke? I need to sort out recent postmortem breaks, old postmortem breaks, and then other kinds of breaks. So if I look at for instance, this is a fragment of an elbow bone right here, forearm bone. This is a radius, a radius of forearm bone. And if I look at, for instance, the two sides that fit together, they will reach up, they'll articulate perfectly together. And within this, you can see that over time, you have this extremely fine silt. It's a fine, silty clay. It's a soil at this particular location. It's extremely fine, and it will percolate through the little vessels, the little blood vessel areas, and into the bone will work its way in. And in this instance, the bones then are not at all, but mostly filled with calcium carbonate and sediment and silt and calcite inside of it. The cortex itself, the actual bone itself, because it's white, I know that that is a recent fracture that occurred at the time the bones came out. Everything that I'm talking about, I'm talking to our assistants, and they're talking to my assistant who's recording our words on a computer because we have a very detailed record. And of course, that record's going to evolve as we go on as we begin to piece things together and fit things together. But I'm also doing diagrams, and we're going to do different types of diagrams. But when you look at this one, for instance, these are the taller bones. This is right bottom, this is left bottom, this is the up superior, this is the inferior. And things that I'm going to note, for instance, is I'm going to know what condition.
condition that bubble is in. So if I look at his white cloud, I look white cloud on the person, it has one fraction of broken that bubble into two pieces. Seems insignificant, but when you put it in the bigger picture of things, it becomes very important. If I look at it in comparison to his left cloud or his left cloud, it's missing a portion right here, a shape of the star. It's missing the end over here, this purple hand. And it has a fraction here and a fraction here. So this bubble is actually piece missing, one, two, three, four, five separate pieces. Something is different in the post-mortem processes that affected this bone than the right cloud. And you can talk about that. It's a little hard to read, but one of the things that you'll see, there's another thing here that I'm talking about, CCS, that's column and color on the bone. You'll see me talking about multiple <coughs> colors here. It's white, white, uh, white brown, for instance. All of that gets positive. And it's looking to see if red ochre is present for one specific one component of it. Here, for example, is the left humerus. And you're seeing all the sides of the front side, anterior, the back side, posterior. You're looking at the inside, which is medial, lateral. And I'm making notes on where the fracture occurred. I'm making notes on the color. I'm making notes on uh, how many pieces it's broken into. All these types of things I write on here, this section right here, this left humerus right here, has got something that when I first look at it, it looks bleached, it looks white in color. And when you go back to the government studies, one of the things they talk about is the fact that some of the bones, particularly this bone and this bone in here, has bleaching. And they use that, for instance, the presence of exposure to the sun and the bleaching to argue that the process of eroding on the bank took in their words, weeks to months. And I'm used to seeing bones exposed out, and there are studies, who would think it, but there are studies that even document how fast bleaching can occur in different environmental settings. And so, for instance, in the Sonoran Desert, where you really have intense sun, they, they, I can show you a publication where they're saying that you usually don't see sun bleaching on bones for at least two months, and more likely six months. It takes a while. So if that was the case, if that was truly bleaching, you're talking an extended period of time coming out of the bank. And that's what the government signed for writing, weeks and months. Here's the color bone. It's a right column. It's a right color bill is made up of a right hip bone, right column, left hip bone, and a sacrum of the bridge. And so we're going to document the color bone, we're going to talk about the, you know, where we have a thousand parts. These are part of our notes, just part of our notes. And I have really two different kinds of notes, three different kinds. I have the person recording on the computer who's taking our words down and basically putting them in the English and then we're going to edit them and edit them and then they're going to become the substance of some of these reports. The second set of notes that we have are going to be diagrams like this. I'm doing this in my forensic cases. If I'm dealing with somebody that's plunked on the head, I am literally not only photographing the fracture, but I'm drawing it out, I'm measuring them, I'm talking about certain frontal fractures, primary radiating fractures, all of that. We need that type of diagram. The third type of thing that is going to go into our world of data is a very systematic computerized coding system. And in this, when I examine a skeleton, I have worked on human skeletons for decades, and I've used the same system, and it will start out and we determine the person's information on their age, their sex, their ancestry. We take extremely detailed cranial measurements and extremely detailed post-cranial measurements. We'll see how that fits in. We score dental pathology, we score bone pathology. I am very much a dentist. I know probably probably as much about a tooth as your dentist does, and I would really say probably more than most of them because I do a lot of studies of teeth. However, in this particular project, we would even bring in two specialists, two of them, one of the and the other one is, is Dr. Christy Turner, who is the leading person in terms of dental traits, dental genetic traits. And so we will bring in specialists. It's kind of strange to me, but we brought in a person from Dr. Hoskins University as part of his team who looks at microware, microscopic under, under high resolution microscopy, a microscopic wear on two. We have a dietary information in process of contaminates in food. I mean this guy who lives and breathes little scratches of teeth. Who would think anybody would study that as a living? But there are people out there that you know, I swear they think the whole purpose for the skeleton is to hold the teeth so they can study it. <laughs> So, we have then also computerized codes. My score and my more extensive databases, the same thing as here, I score on my computer 
1,500 different variables that relate to both of all. They break down into different categories, such as you know, really rheumatoid, osteoarthritis, and other major categories are going to be all different types of trauma, all different types of infections. Those are the major categories. So when I score trauma marks, I'm asking the question, you know, where is it located? What type of fracture is it? Is it a bladed fracture? Is it blunt force trauma? Is it blunt force round trauma? Is it blunt force oval trauma? I'm measuring it. I'm asking the question, is it healed? Or healing? All of these things get tracked in the computer. Same way with all of the dental pathology studies. We do this just routinely. It is exceedingly tedious. It takes a lot of time, but if you are caught up in that and you see how that information can, can tell you about that individual, that's why you do it. And in part, we we'll look at this individual story, but to put it in the perspective of others of that time period or other groups. I mentioned the presence or absence of red over. Important. Raised by the government scientists and evidence that was there, and it is not there. This is an example. I'm used to seeing red over. I've seen it in a number of instances. This is a 10,600 year old, one and a half year old child on site in Montana. It is associated with a clover site there called the Kansas site, and there's lots of red over on the artifacts that are associated with those bones, and there is lots of uh, red over on bones, and it gives them, when you look at it in person, a very distinctive red cast. There is no red over on the The other part of the debate can say, is it red over a surface exposure that got silver over? Is the question is, is there evidence of animal? The government scientists in looking at this pointed out that there was on at least nine or ten bones evidence of road gnawing, road gnawing, and in some um, other bones, evidence of medium size, not specific as to what it was, but medium size animal damage on the animal scavenger. Within that, I can deal with this all the time. I deal with forensic cases and if you have remains exposed, it would have been the same thing 10,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, and it's the same thing in some of the forensic when you're know, dealing with outdoor world situations. Animals can find remains and they can cause damage to it. This is a case, for instance, from West Virginia. It's an individual that was out for a very, very period of time on a black bear found her veins. And this is all in a very special form of search. This is all that was found of that individual. Different animals, different species actually will cause distinctive types of damage. And a bear, because of their, their jaw structure, their size of the teeth, and the musculature, they can cause extreme damage to the, to the remains in a relatively short period of time. And you will see, for instance, very distinctly puncture marks in this forensic case, and along the shoulder blade. This is this scapula right here. This is a canine tooth puncture. This is another tooth puncture right here. That's not found on the this is another forensic case that I processed. This was the last year and a half. And it's, a, it's a woman that was out for only a period of a few weeks. And within that, the bear had found those remains, the type of punctures that we see. This is a left, left hip bone, left mouth, say, right mouth, right femur, cubic bones are damaged right here in the front. And all of this loss of bone is because of animal scavenging. This is what I would expect to see if you have a surface exposure for any length of time at all. And in terms of this time period, if you're going back in thousands of years, it is going to be certainly even more luminous. And within that, we see that. There are two examples that I know from remains that are in the thousands of years of antiquity where there has been strong evidence suggesting animal scavenging. One of them is from a site in, in Alaska, it's on these these caves, it's 10,000 years old, and there's a young man who's about 20 years of age that was, remains were found in a cave, and it has an entrance referred to as the bear entrance, and within the bear entrance, uh, a few bones of this individual were found, oops, and it has very distinctive carnival sounding, like I would see, not altogether different, my friends in case, the loss of all of this bone up here, the loss of bone back here. This is a puncture tooth mark here, loss of the cubic bones. That type of thing can occur, but it does not occur in the kennel's man remains. However, there is the assertion that there is animal damage, which suggests some sort of exposure. When we go through the bones, we are experiencing in identifying small parts. 
Because bones don't usually come in my field completely. And within this, for instance, and now I have to go back 40 years old, 35 or 40 years, and when you train a human osteology, when I first began training at this, one of the final tests that you have is what's referred to as the black box test. And in the black box, the little box is big, and you stick your hand in there, and there's going to be a bone in there, or a piece of a bone, and you have to just like touch the field. The body is touch the field, you have to say, this is a, and you get tested in part of this one of one of your how you do this. Well, when you're used to working with bones and you work with bones all the time, you become very experienced with what they look like and you can begin to identify them. We need to, in any case that I work with, forensic or historic or prehistoric, I need to know exactly what I've got and we will spend time doing what archaeologists call refitting. They refit the different point pieces together. And this is, for instance, a left rib, and in this left rib, this is going to be that. Where it hooks onto your back and your neck area, this is going to be the sternal portion of the here. And you can fit all of these pieces and they will fit together. Within this, one of the things that I want to do is I want to know exactly what I have, and I also how I'm very interested in these fractures. How these bones are broken. And how these bones are broken, I want to tell me something about positioning within the terrace And so I need to be able to see, first look at a single bone, and then I need to be able to look at the left bone versus the right bone, and look across the skeleton to see what the pattern is. So in this particular picture here, you have me bottom to my research assistant. She is an extremely accomplished forensic anthropologist. She knows the bones exceedingly well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask her to, so I can continue this catalog study. I'm going to ask her to lay out the skeleton so that I can look at the left versus the right. I can get the pattern up and down that skeleton to be able to begin to reassemble what exactly is going on. And the way to do this, because I also need to measure these bones and things like that, the way to do this is we're going to take a table, put a rim around that table, it's about two inches high, put several bags, 50 pound bags of sand in them, and then cover it with a soft black belt like cloth. And that way she can put bones together and bunch the clay, not the sand this way and that way, so that it will come together without actually having to Blues. I'm going to put this on the floor because you're talking about something that ultimately weighs several hundred pounds. So she's going to start now. This is one of the reasons why the skeleton is so important because most of the time when you're dealing with this time period, you get fragments that you can hold in the hand. They are exceedingly rare, as I say. You can count on your fingers the number of well preserved, dated skeletons in this time period. So the opportunity, really the privilege, the opportunity to examine the things to learn from the skeleton about who he was and what his life was like has as, as, as something that, that is. That I, I, I feel um, that has been an incredible opportunity for me to pursue and actually be able to, 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 to make. Now, within this, I'm going to point out a couple of things. This is his right hand bone, this is his left hand bone. This is where the projectile point is right here that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about this instead of that. I'm going to also focus on as we get into this, I'm going to talk about some of these injuries. There are breaks, I'm going to talk about fractures, and within the fracture, I will point out that there are fractures from different time periods. For one thing, he has injuries that occur in a lot. This is a very hard to control. This is a really tough shot, and he sustained a lot of injuries. And within this, for one thing, you're not going to see it at this end, but he has a heel depression fracture right here on the left side of his skull. He has a heel depression fracture on the left side of his skull right here in his spiral. He has multiple rib fractures on the left side. Well, one fracture on his left side, multiple fractures on his right side. He has this projectile point embedded right here, that right guard point. So we'll talk about this. You will see this layout. There's another reason that I want to lay this out is so that I can begin to illustrate specific observations 
on a diagram where I'm talking about a fossil skeleton, and you'll see how we use it. Now, autonomy. Autonomy when I was a graduate student. These fields continue to develop, they continue to learn new types of information. And I can tell you, when I grew up in the wild, I had never, ever heard of the word for the gap politics. It was not until I went into the wild and basically the end of my junior year that I took a class in human osteology to study the human skeleton that I was ever even exposed to, and that set me down a path that I didn't even know existed. Well, I was writing one of these cases, case of course, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I would have never, ever used the word fall. Didn't know anything about it. Didn't know it existed. Didn't know what it was. Now it enters into my reports all the time. The fall may be able to go close to one fall and affect an organism after its death. Those close to one fall that affect the skeleton. And it comes out of paleontology. It's really trying to answer the question, why is this dinosaur skeleton or this dinosaur bone preserved when we know there are tons of dinosaurs and very few of them are actually found? And there are certain types of environmental fossils that occur after the death of the organism that facilitate recovery and preservation. An extremely important question related to this was not one that I would have envisioned necessarily going into it, but because that body was positioned in the ground how that individual was laid out. The government scientists, without really having any strong evidence, said that the skeleton came out over a period of weeks to months and it was in a fetal position on its left side and it broke out to be what it, they refer to, they write the appendicular skeleton coming first, which means the limbs coming first, it's in a fetal position, and then that's followed much later by the spinal column of the chest. Because they had that framework, we were seeing different things, so we needed to document and we needed to turn to the bottom. And so we can address the issue of positioning. They also debated as to where it came out within the tank, within the, the, the soil bank. And they ultimately settled that it came out somewhere between, it is a six foot high plus bank. It is basically two meters high. It is somewhere in their reports between 60, 60 and 160 centimeters in a depth, a level like that. I will take you into, and who would think I could ever even imagine doing this, but I will take you within centimeters of where this came from within that terrace bank. And that all comes from the field, the bottom. Within this, there are multiple lines of evidence, and one of them has to do with something that you have lots of in your soil, and you dig down deep enough. You run into a white substance, you call it calcium carbonate, you might call it calcite, you might call it calici, it goes by different names, but it's that white carbon type of crystal. And the thing about it is it is in arid environments of the core. It starts out naturally in our atmosphere, you have rain. Well, within rain, our atmosphere includes a lot of carbon dioxide, CO2 in it, and when you have moisture coming in, it mixes the water, mixes with the CO2 and it forms a mild acid, a carbonic acid. You're getting acid rain, you're getting acid rain coming down. When it hits the top soil layer, the agarized nail site, when it hits that, it starts mixing other things in the soil, including carbonates, and it forms in water. It dissolves into the water, calcium carbonate, and it's carrying that calcium carbonate down into the deeper, deeper layer. How much rain you have is going to determine how much deeper it goes down. In the eastern U.S. where I am, I don't usually deal with skeletons that have calcium carbonate in water because there's so much rain that it flushes the water all the way down to the groundwater and it just goes right through. The same way you get on the other side of the Cascades, you will have so much rainwater that it carries it down. But here you have this rain shadow effect. You have limited precipitation in the area where the skeleton was found. Was, was found and it carries this calcium carbonate down into the soil to a certain depth until it starts to dry out. And as it starts to dry out, these products start lumping onto it. If there's a pebble, it starts adhering to it. So, for example, this is from a site called Mountaineer Site near Gunnison, Colorado, and this is a rhyolite stone core. It's a stone tool, it's an artifact. And this is the top side of it, and this is the bottom side of it. 
The amazing thing about this is when the rainwater comes down, it hits the top of whatever it is, and it goes around it, and then it begins to rip off the bottom of it, and it starts to accumulate on the bottom of it. So archaeologists call these geochemical indicators. And you can take that block into a museum and look at it 50 years ago, and you can tell what was the top side of that like that, and what was the bottom side, because the calcium carbonate was going to build up on the bottom of it. And then if it's in a carbonate rich zone, it's going to gradually get thicker on the bottom, thicker on the bottom, thicker, and it's going to creep around and creep around until it encases the whole thing. Why do the kettle stones? One of the things that I will see is that his bones, this is a network of a circle river, his bones have this calcium carbon, calcium carbon, etc. itself, which is fine soap that is gluing on the bones by the pressure of calcium carbon. So if I look at this blood number, why I look at the nerve part, the back portion of it, this is where it's building up. And it's not the front side. So it's an indicator, that's going to tell me that that vertebra is positioned with his posterior portion of that bone down. If I look at his femur, his thigh bone, I'm looking at the front and the back side of it. No, here I'm looking at just the back side of it. This is his left femur. And all of this nodular gray stuff that you're seeing, and this is something that we're documenting in our in our CCS that I was recording, is beginning to build up on the posterior surface on the back side. Building our building up a lot of money after your hamstring muscles are attached. So taking this way out now, one of the most amazing things is when you begin assembling the skeleton as to what's connected and what's not, if it had suffered any type of exposure to cause any sort of disassembling of the bone, scattering of the bone, spreading of the bone. Anything like that, this can tell you some clues. We're looking at the layout here, and every place that I have put, every place that I have put an indicator like this, this is telling me that one bone has fused to another, and it's glued itself together by this calcium carbon glue. So if I look at, for instance, it's sacrum right here, this is his left hip bone, part of the sacrum is glued to that bone. His right hip bone, part of the sacrum is glued to that bone. His foot bones, some of them are glued together, his hand bones, some of them are glued together. And so if I look at, for instance, his hip bones and how the sacrum attaches, if you look real close, this is called the ring for surface, the sacrum attaches right here. Very important to get the age of the man, also looking at that little different color piece of sacrum right here, that cancel piece of bone, that is from the sacrum. It's not part of the bone, it is glued to that bone. Same way with the piece right down here. It is not from the bone, it is glued to that bone. That tells me it was an intact color for thousands of years. Because one of the things that the geochemist will do is he can take this white, gray carbonate and date it. And whereas the skeleton is in the 8,000 plus range, those carbons are forming with the amount of things, they're forming 2,500, 3,000 years ago. And so if he's been in place 2,000 years before that calcium carbon started to form, and it is an absolutely intact skeleton that is having some of them glued together. So, vertebrae, for instance, I have vertebrae that are fused together. And you're not used to looking at pieces of parts. Sometimes these pieces are hard to understand. But this right up here, for instance, is a third cervical vertebra, or a third thoracic vertebra. This is a second thoracic vertebra. And if you flip them around, they are the articular facets that were fused together and glued together. This foot bones, this is a first metatarsal. It is the main portion of the foot where your big toe bones connect your big toe so forth. And this is the first one. This is the second one. And they are adhered together, glued together by this gray calcium carbon. This fracture right here, that's an old fracture. That's a grind fracture, longitudinal grind fracture. That fracture is thousands of years old. 
there are different fractures that occur at different time periods, and there are you know, ribs in the vertebrae from the way this was, there are those types of fractures, fractures like this, and, and those are old. If I find out the cross of skeleton, if I look at the arms, it's humor, and I follow it down, when I look at his humor, for instance, this is a right upper arm bone. And this right arm bone has relatively little calcium carbon on it. And if I get underneath it, it has relatively little, little calcium carbon on it. A little part of this height, if you look at this green cast right here, there's green algae that is formed on that surface of the bone. We'll talk more about that. This area here, I'll show you a picture of this. This is the area, one of the areas that was identified by the government scientists as having animal damage, animal scavenging, uh, destruction of the bones. So it's an area of damage. So if I look at his left femur now, I'm now further down, from top to bottom, going down, further down, and if I look at his left femur, top to of it, this is where the ball of the femur fits into your hip socket. And you can see that I've got a problem with a little bit, just a little bit. And if I look at the back side, it's like with my stone floor, I'm getting more. It's building up on the hand after all the spray dog water. It's starting to get a little more three dimensional. If I go a little further down, now I'm in the mid shaft of the femur, or the mid shaft of the femur, the mid shaft of the femur, on the upside, the anterior side, not so much, but a little bit. But if I go to the back, the hamstring is attached along the foot and the I'm starting to get three dimensional calcium carbon building up. It is doing just like that rock. It's falling underneath, and it's telling me what side is up and what side is down. If I go a little bit deeper down into the, into the, uh, more inferior into the bone, down near the knee, this is the knee joint area, and now I'm starting to get more three dimensional buildup of calcium carbon on this particular right femur. And so I'm starting to see these nodules here, I'm starting to see thicker on the bottom side. I'm starting to see a little bit of erosion of this joint surface here, a little bit of knee problems with the pelvis happening. Here is his shin bone, the top part near the knee of his, of his tibia. And right here, this is where the fibula, this is a, a left tibia, where it articulates where it attaches. And if I look at this piece of calcium carbon, this bone is broken up, and there are fragments of this bone that have glued to that surface, right here and this right here. And it's telling me that throughout the skeleton, the vertebra, the hips, the toe bones, things are glued together. That is an articulated skeleton. And in that process, this articulated skeleton, the individual is laying on his back. When I'm down all the way to the lower legs, the shin bone, I'm looking at the distal half, the inferior half of the left tibia, left shin bone. Now I'm starting to see calcium carbon and go all the way around the bone. So there's a real difference between what's up higher and what's down lower. When I go up here, I have relatively little calcium carbon. I have a base in that area here. I have little bits of it, but as I go down the skeleton, gradually get more and more calcium carbon. If I'm down in the front there, and this is his heel bone, this calcaneus, left calcaneus. If you follow this out, you plot all of these surfaces, one of the things that I can tell you is that the man is laying on his back, he is extended on his back, and his left foot has rolled over on its side. Rolled over on its left side. The other foot, as it decomposed, it collapsed in an extended position. When I look at the hand bones, now these hand bones are tumbled in the, in the moving current, but when I look at the hand bones, this is the pole side, for instance, and it's a little bit of being out of the surf, if you call it surf, or, or the way back, but I can see the three dimensional calcium carbon developing on both of these hands. When I look at both of them, the palms are there. And the palms are at the side of the body, and they are at the side of the body where I'm going more into this calcium carbon enriched zone. And I can tell you that the hand is at his side, the palms down, and with that, it's not resting on your pelvis. If it was, I would have adhesions where these bones would actually be fusing in the pelvis. It's not up here, it's not higher, the hands are at the side. Only different line of Dr. Brenner is going to look at fire. And independent of calcium carbon and things like that, what I want him to impart to tell me is what these factors are telling you about post mortem process. Within this, he's going to do the same thing. He's going to type about it. 
Is there some of the Dr. Barron's diagrams where he's going to trace out each fracture? He's going to describe the upper fracture surface and the lower fracture surface. So, in other words, the fracture surface on this side of the bone, the fracture surface on this bone. He's going to draw in what we refer to as primary fractures and secondary fractures. And he's going to interpret this is what his diagram looks like for the, for the left tumor. We'll do that for each of the different long bones. Within that, what he's reading is he's going into biomechanics and he's going into engineering and engineering principles. And within this, he's looking at a bone like a femur as a tube, a tubular bone. And what you're talking about, and this is not designed for him again, this is designed for forensic interpretation. But within this, within this, one of the things he's going to point out is he's going to say, bone is like mild steel. It is extremely strong, but of course you can break it, you all know that. And within that, when it breaks, it breaks under tension. When I take and put a load on a bone, I put a weight on it, and I just set it back or whatever, when I put forces on a bone, and I begin to take that bone and I begin to bend it and bend it and bend it before it breaks. What breaks is the side that is trying to split apart the tension side, and the side underneath is the compression side. Bones don't break under compression, they break under tension. So you can take this bone, for instance, and see where you're putting a fixed end. This is where it's really locked in. So for your, for your reconstruction, let's say this is still in the soil bank, and it's held tightly in the soil. And if I have an end that is exposed, and I've got the wall, which is this soil bank pushing down on it, I'm going to start to see the crack occur here. And the crack is going to evolve, and it's going to go uh, through the bone in the way that I can interpret. I can identify secondary fractures, primary fractures. I can identify the tension side, the compression side. And as it almost separates, it reverses the direction, and it forms what is referred to in our, in our world as a breakaway spur. And a breakaway spur, a breakaway spur point to the side that the load is being pushed off down on. And so all of these fractures are things that he's going to report that allow him to, in a collective case, read very clearly because the bone has got a lot of power in it, lots of protein, it's very straightforward. It's more subtle than this type of work, but the same principles apply. And it's going to allow him then to draw these fractures and interpret where the fracture originates, how it propagates through the bone, what end is solidly still held in the bank, what end is starting to collapse in the bank problems. And here, for instance, as a tip, you have a bone with a breakaway spur. This is going to be the tension side, this is going to be the compression spot side. This is the side of the tissue of All of those different types of indicators. Same way with a femur, these are incomplete fractures of the femur, but the load is pushing down from the top on this, and it is separating here tension, it goes into a longitudinal grind fracture, separating here, that's, that's going to be the tension side pushing down. All of those, to someone like this, is very beautiful. Just like when you read a skeleton or read a book, he, he can read these fractures and he can follow them as they go through the bone. So he, he's interpreting the left femur, for instance. He can follow the propagation of the speed of the fracture and see how it separates and then tell what's up and what's down, what end is fixed, what end is free to move. When he does this, what he's going to say in these long bones from these fractures. Because he's going to say, for instance, in the tension side, tension on the femur starts off the anterior, the front side. So he is going to, from a totally different line of evidence, he is going to say, the skeleton is on its back. The skeleton is on its back. And he is going to say, in reading the practice, the bang gives way first at the knees, and then it progresses up the body and down the body. The first area of that bang contained with skeleton is going to be in the area of the knees that gives way. Macro abrasions and perforation. All right, macro abrasions, that's our word. It was referred to as, as it's a gross abrasions, it's abrasions. It was referred to as possible animal scavenging. This is plotting that out. Also, corrosion, it's a geology term. It's not corrosion, it's corrosion. We wanted to find it. But within that, I can tell you, you've never heard the word corrosion, believe me, before the study, I've never heard it either. It's a geology term. Within this, within these macro abrasions, one of the things about them that's very surprising is they are very pattern. That's why we do this type of full inspection of the skeleton. 
When you have these erosion areas, these abraded areas, they are on the left side always. Not necessarily they are on the left side, meaning the lateral side. This bone can have two, but if it is, it's on the interior, on the medial side. So it's a damaging process that comes from left to right. So if I look at the left humerus, for instance, and I focus on the whole portion of that left humerus, one of the things that I can see is this area that was described initially as sun bleach. And it's lighter color. If I look at this right here, there's green algae staining. It doesn't show up much as green, but we will fly out the green color. And this is initially what was described as sun bleaching. Exposure to the sun, you have a painting on the wall, and it gets the sun getting into the light, which is the color. It's that process. Well, within this, that bone uh, is bleached, but it's not really. And you see it more closely here, and you see the green algae staining. We have a different specialist contributing a different chapter in the name of Dr. Morris, and he is a specialist in benthic algae. Well, algae, who would think it would be contributed, but it does. The reason it does is in two ways. For one thing, for algae forming bone, or for algae forming anything, for one thing, you need a substrate, something that is attached to it. That could be a rock, it could be a stick, it could be a bone. It needs wet conditions, which we've got here, and it can also be, it also requires sunlight. If it is exposed to the sunlight, but that requires sunlight to be the size of sunlight, then you have to have sunlight for these photosynthesis type plants out of the form. And if you have any exposure, it can fall fairly quickly depending on the species. So there's two lines of evidence we can get from this. For one thing, he, by a simple little swab on the surface, he can look at the filaments, the little green algae filaments, and tell you what species this is. He can identify. And there's really three different kinds of plant kind of communities out there that can produce this green portable stain. But he can identify as with a specific species. Then from that, he knows a lot about the color and how that is grow. He's going to say a couple of things. If you have algae on it, it's exposed to the sun. There's different times of that that occur, but he's going to say what's up and down. So, different line of evidence. If you can look at this bone here, if you look at this side, the elbow bone, it's green, it's green algae stain. That's telling you that that's the whole cup and sunlight can hit it. You put that bone over, it is not green. There's no algae. There's another indicator of what's up and what's down. In the same sense, and I'm just skipping ahead a little bit, the other thing that he's going to do. He's going to look at the amount of rain, know the species, and he's going to say, this is not weeks to months. Think of your dog dishes that close the sun out there, and how fast you get algae growing in it. He's going to look at the amount of green stain on this, and he's going to say, this took, in the erosion process, a week to the first two weeks. So it's going to be time to get all of This is not sun bleaching. This is corrosion. What corrosion is, is when you have a part of the bone starting to be exposed to the last of the water that's carrying particulates in it. It's carrying this fine silk to a sand It's water grip. So it's the bone that's being exposed to wave action, and that's what's causing it to pop. It is not sun exposure. There is a very interesting pattern when you look at it in the sense that if you look at the cranial wall, so the black side of the cranial wall is pigmented from iron staining. That's normal iron staining on bone. And if you look at this right here, this side is the left side of the head. You have a clear water mark right here, where this is actually embedded in this sediment. Up there like that. And you start seeing pop marks hitting. This is where the wave action is hitting it. And this area right here, which has been some discussion as to whether it's like a pollen induced or infection induced. This is again corrosion that is from wave action. It is a post forming process. So, using your imagination a little bit, if you rotate this whole back, you can see a line where at the time where this was just starting to erode out, this was still encased in the soil, still protected, still embedded in the soil, as was this up here for a while. And the bank is away and exposes initially this portion, this portion of the cranium right here, and it starts hitting and growing through. That's corrosion. And what that's telling you, for one thing, two things. 
the left side of the skeleton. The water is on its left side. The left side, the wave action is coming from the left side. That's why I pointed out the cloud was light, like, and I said, you know, you look at the white cloud, the white cloud, the white cloud is broken into two pieces, whereas the left one is broken into five pieces. For a period of time, there is more wave action damage. This does not take long, but more wave action damage. So if you compare left to right, the left, in terms of preservation, is not as good as the right. And that's because you know, the whole thing starts to get away, gets away very fast. But there is a period where this calcium carbon is like blue and it's holding in the bag and it's being exposed. Second thing this tells you is it's telling you how his head is positioned in the sense that this man, his head is not working straight up. In, in, in essence, he has got somewhat up with his hand resting on the chin area, resting on the chin area, and if you kind of follow that a little bit, you'll just see that it's in this position, the chin will be right here. And this is still in case you might. You can do the same thing in virtual reality. You go inside the frame. Inside the frame, there's soft settle inside, and a lot of that was taken out by the government scientists in the sense it was loose, it was unsolidated, and they were taking it out with the idea that they wanted to compare stratigraphically to soil profile to try and figure out whether it came from this level of the bank or this level of the bank. This one, them, as I said, they, they came to the conclusion, so through some very fine studies, they came to do some conclusions that it came somewhere in this two meter section between 60 centimeters and 160 centimeters. Well, one of the things that you can say about it is that with this head, I know it's the right side of the head, and you're inside the frame of wall, and when you're inside the frame of wall, you have the high of the up, and again, this rainwater carrying this calcium carbon comes down, and some of them will enter through the orbital fissures, go up through the mountain, or go inside the frame where it hits the base of the skull, and it really consolidates at the base of the skull. So if I look at the high of the frame of wall in terms of how the head is in position, I've got a lot of what the geologists would call vacuoles or velocity. It's not all of this is right here. That's why it's not as dense, but when you get down to the base, all of this is coming down, it's very hard ground coming down. And so when you're in the base area here, the nuclear area, that's where it really consolidates with hard calcium carbon. Now hard calcium carbon, the government scientists took out some, but they didn't take that out. Plus it would be very hard to do. Very hard to do because it's Within this, we can't have another microscope to try and figure out what they are. And within this, this is the kind of stuff that we can describe as animal damage, animal damage. It's not. This is not what animal damage looks like. This is the one the humor I see is very kind of irregular, the erosive area, this type of erosion that you do, and I'm used to seeing it all the time. Animal damage looks different. Here, for instance, these are two other bones that were described as having animal damage. Here, Broken eye, described as broken eye. I can see broken eye all the time. This is what it looks like here, for instance, on this one case. This erosion area right here, lots of its layer. This is classic broken eye. Very different, very pattern. This is a shin bone with classic broken eye. It's very different. What you're dealing with in those instances are where the bones, as water is coming up against the remains, you're getting a, essentially debris in the water, branches, the bridge comes down into contact with the bone, and as the waves move it up and down against the bone, it's storing, it's catching, it's modified. We call it that corporation security process. Within this, and I'll give you a break in just a couple minutes before we start going into the health issues. But within this, Dr. Chapman is a geologist that described out the profile of the site in 1997. Visiting site. And there are a number of things that are hard to see in here, but you're going to have the top soil, you're going to have the very top soil, and you're going to have going down almost two meters worth of the top. The top 75 centimeters after you get on the A horizon, the very top the top soil. The top 75 centimeters is going to be windblown soil. 
in the geologist is called the field, the soil. You're going to find something to fill in. You're going to have within that, you're going to have, you know, uh, you're going to have a fine line that they track out of this action that's from the mountains on, the eruption about 6,000, 700 years ago. So they're going to be able to follow that. Underneath that, you get into an area, you notice he's using the same thing. You've got it all around, he's doing muscle pull and all this, too. It's all interrelated. And he has what he describes as the upper BCA horizon. A is the top soil, B is the subsoil underneath that. And in old style geology, which is what most geologists understand, they will call it the BCA. The lower level of the top BCA is calcium. Now they're called the BK, but it's the BCA line as he drew his map right here. And it is a calcium layer, calcium rich layer that begins at about 75 centimeters down and carries down to about 170 to about 100 centimeters. And when you look at the soil back in these photographs, you'll see that it's got a fight zone. That's not solid fossil carbon. If it were on for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries, it would become more and more white than the calcium carbon. But that is an enriched calcium carbon zone. As you get even further down, there it is what he's going to describe a lower ECA. That other one, the upper ECA, from the environment of the time, that one from his data of about 2,500 to 3,000 years ago. It's recent. It is, in terms of geology time, upper Holocene. It is something that the remains have been there many, many years, and many thousands of years. And then there is an earlier, earlier old scene, BCA derived from the down low. The skeleton did not come out of this one, out of this one here. It actually, it just is the most amazing thing. That skeleton is right at the level where you've got this upper BCA derived. And that skeleton has got a little of the facial bone. It is partially out of it, such as you're getting very little of the calcium carbon on these bones, very little on these, but just starting to form on the back to the vertebrae. It's right at that, and it dips down into this BCA horizon, this upper calcium carbon horizon. If you'd have been a foot higher, you wouldn't have that indicator. If you'd have been a foot lower, you'd have that horizon. And what's underneath is done in its upper calcium carbon to your cell is another layer and it's soft and silty and there's no carbons in it, it's not top. And so when this whole process, when you plop down and look at it, you've got the soil bank and this, if you use your imagination a little bit, you can see kind of a white on that, so it's got calcium carbon. This is at the locality of the site. That's the late Holocene BCA. This is a soft side, and when the waves come up in, in, in height, when they come up in height, then that undercuts because there's nothing that's very soft, the waves can undercut it, and when it undercuts, it's cutting between this calcium rich blue together zone and this floor of calcium rich blue together zone and it undercuts. So when it cuts into it, it undercuts it, and then from the top, once you start getting it, you start getting cracks, they call it piping, where you're starting to get banks, parts of the bank clean off. And so you can see a big area that's missing right here, for instance, and these little remnant blocks here are areas that were removed with that bank, and they fall <coughs> down, and the root mass was still holding it together, but it gradually disaggregates, breaks up. And in that process, so within that, then you can identify from all of these different lines of evidence, you can identify where the skeleton was flattened out here. He is right in partially in that thousand carbon area. He's above the soil thousand carbon area. And he's at that level. And within that, through geometry and figuring out this man is five feet seven and working geometry and cosines and all that sort of business. You can actually calculate that this man has his head slightly above that BCA horizon and going into it, and he dips into very, very slightly at a slight angle, and that his feet are more fully in, and it all covers between roughly 70 and 
85 or 90 centimeters in that bank of the pond. It's all in that zone. And you can calculate that that body, inadvertently, to calculate that that body is at a very, very slight angle. It brings a head higher and feet lower. It's at an angle of about 35 degrees. You can look at how long it took. It took about a week to a few weeks for this to come out. And one of the things that you can bring into that, uh, courtesy of the floor this year, is you can look at the lake levels. So we plot the lake levels for 1995, all the blue, and then all the 1996. And there was a lot of flooding, very high lake levels here in June, as you see right here. They go down, the lake level goes down, and then comes back up. The discovery time is right here. If this set of remains, had come out, had a road, there was a lot of debate, weeks to months and things like that. They didn't come out right here. And then it went down, it's on the bank, and then he went this island. I can tell you, these remains were scattered all over. And instead of having a complete skeleton, he would have had very complete recovery. And so there's two lines of data stock more looking at the outline saying, ha, that's just not, you know, there's green dog, it's just not that weak. Weak for three weeks. And then you can look at the white models and now look at what is going. I'm going to stop here for a few minutes, give you a chance to stretch your legs, and then I'm going to go into what I think the man looked like, and who he's related to, and how it is.